It's the 11th of April. Welcome to BBC Newsroom Live. I'm Lucrasa Burak. Now, the WikiLeaks co-founder, Julian Assange, has been arrested at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Police were invited into the embassy by the ambassador after the Ecuadorian government withdrew its asylum. Well, Scotland Yard says he'll appear at Westminster Magistrates Court as soon as is possible. Mr. Assange had taken refuge in the embassy seven years ago to avoid extradition to Sweden over a sexual assault case that has since been dropped. Our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale, has the latest on the case. Well, essentially, this is the product of a long negotiation between the British government and the Ecuadorian government. The Ecuadorian government, under its current leadership, have been trying to solve this problem for a long time and <clears throat> find a, a resolution. Um, and the, the solution that they currently seem to have found is this, that the Ecuadorians have decided that uh, Mr. Assange is in breach of his asylum conditions because of his activity and behaviour within the embassy here in London. As a result, they have withdrawn that asylum. Asylum. Mm. As a result, and certainly according to the police statement issued by Scotland Yard, the police were then invited in by the Ecuadorians, because obviously the Ecuadorian embassy is Ecuadorian soil. <clears throat> and once they were there, they presented um, uh, Mr. Assange with a warrant on behalf of Westminster Magistrates Court um, for uh, refailing to surrender to the court. This is the original br the breach of the bail conditions that have been hanging around for years now, mm. um, ever since this original case began, you know, seven, seven years ago. So that's what happened. That's why the police were allowed in. The police arrested Mr. Assange. Um, he was taken in, uh, into uh, a truck, a van, and then he was removed to a central London police station. Uh, and then the police say that they hope then um, to uh, take him to Westminster Magistrates Court as soon as is possible. That was uh, James Landale, our diplomatic correspondent, speaking to Victoria uh, Derbyshire. Uh, earlier. Well, we have got a number of uh, reactionary statements uh, on this uh, latest news. We'll start off with uh, Sir Alan Duncan, who has released a statement. Um, he's the Minister for State and uh, Europe and the Americas. He says it's absolutely right um, that Assange will face justice in the proper way in the UK. It is for the courts to decide what happens uh, next. Uh, the statement goes on to say we are very grateful to the government of Ecuador under President Moreno for the action they have taken. Today's events follow extensive dialogue between our two countries. I look forward to a strong bilateral relationship between the UK and Ecuador in the years ahead. So that statement from uh, Sir Alan Duncan. We've also um, had the latest uh, statement um, from the President of uh, Ecuador, Britain, um, saying in line with our strong commitment to human rights and international law, I requested Great Britain to guarantee that Mr. Assange would not be extradited uh, to a country where he could face torture or the death penalty. So that coming from President uh, Lenin Moreno. And finally, a quick reaction coming from Russia, uh, saying that um, they hope that the rights of uh, Julian Assange will not be violated after his detention by British authorities. So a lot of reaction coming in um, at the moment. Um, we'll update you on the latest as it comes to us here at BBC News. In the meantime, our correspondent, Caroline Hawkley, uh, looks back on the case, and this report does contain some flash photography. Julian Assange shot to fame with a massive spill of American state secrets. But it was then his personal life that put him at the centre of an international drama that's run for years. See all those people standing down there? This shocking footage first brought WikiLeaks to international attention. That's a weapon. Come on, fire! It shows the killing of a group of Iraqis, including two journalists, by a helicopter gunship. A flood of secret documents on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan followed, and then classified diplomatic cables. This is... To his admirers, he became a champion of free speech and transparency. In the US, he was, is, seen as a threat to national security. In 2010, Julian Assange found himself in a prison van and then in court after Sweden issued an arrest warrant, hoping to question him over allegations made by two Swedish women of sexual assault. Allegations he denies. Soon, to his supporters' delight, he was out on bail. Well, it's great to smell fresh air of London again. Under his bail conditions, he lived in this manor house in Norfolk, owned by a friend. 
He took his appeal against extradition to Sweden to the highest court in the land. But eventually, in 2012, he lost. His appeal against extradition is accordingly dismissed. The Embassy of Ecuador in London became his new home. He'd walked through its doors in June 2012 and asked for political asylum. It was granted. For the UK government, Mr Assange was a fugitive from justice. It spent millions policing the embassy before the round-the-clock guard was lifted. There were public addresses by Julian Assange from the embassy balcony. Can you hear me? This was 2017, on the day the Swedish investigation against him was dropped because prosecutors couldn't pursue the case in his absence. Today is an important victory. But Julian Assange stayed on inside the embassy, fearing that if he was arrested for skipping bail in the UK, he could be extradited to the US. Pamela Anderson was among those who used to go and see him, but last year his visits were strictly curtailed. Relations between Mr Assange and his hosts have badly soured. While he was inside, Ecuador had a change of government and the now president described him as a stone in the shoe. He had new conditions imposed on his stay, including that he avoid online political activity and that he properly looked after his cat. Julian Assange went as far as taking the Ecuadorian government to court over the new rules and lost. He still has some fervent support, but the patience of his hosts has come to an end, and with it, his long, long stay in Knightsbridge. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. Well, our correspondent Andy Moore is outside the Ecuadorian embassy now. So Andy, just update us with where we are and what we do know. Well, we, uh, we know that uh, Julian Assange was uh, taken out of the embassy here uh, earlier on this morning. Uh, police officers from the Metropolitan Police were apparently invited into the embassy uh, behind me uh, by the ambassador. The relationship between Julian Assange uh, and Ecuador having soured. So they went in and they took him out in handcuffs. Uh, I've seen some images very briefly of Mr Assange with a, a, a white beard uh, being taken out of the embassy. And though you can see a, a police presence and a media presence here, obviously we understand Julian Assange himself has been taken away. So we have a, a message from uh, a press release from the Metropolitan Police. They say uh, that Mr Assange was uh, arrested for failing to surrender to the court. This was in connection with uh, uh, a warrant being issued by Westminster Magistrates Court uh, uh, back in 2012, I think it was. So we understand uh, that uh, on behalf of Westminster Magistrates Court, uh, police executed that warrant and Mr Assange, uh, we understand, will be appearing in court uh, fairly soon. This is in connection with something dating back nearly seven years, more than seven years in fact, uh, when he, he was accused of uh, sex assaults in Sweden, though I believe uh, that uh, case has now been dropped because of the, the time that has elapsed. Uh, behind me, uh, behind the white van that's just coming. Uh, there were some supporters of Julian Assange speaking on his behalf. We were told just over a week ago that his, he was going to be thrown out of the embassy within hours or maybe days. So there has been uh, a vigil here in place, certainly over the weekend. And around me I can see posters uh, supporting Julian Assange. So his supporters are arriving here at the embassy, the media obviously arriving at the embassy, but uh, despite the police van you can see behind me, we understand Julian himself, Julian Assange himself, has been taken away. Um, Andy Moore, we'll leave it there for now. As you can see, plenty, uh, plenty of uh, activity behind in there. That's just outside the Equatorian uh, embassy. Um, we have got the latest um, information now regarding his arrest. Um, let's just listen into what was said. OK, 
Okay, so really what we can hear um, here in the background. Okay, so we can hear uh, um, some shouting taking place uh, in the background as uh, Julian Assange, heavily bearded, um, hopefully you could see there as he was taken um, down the steps of the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, shouting as he was put into uh, that van there, James. Now, you alerted us um, to this arrest. Um, as we heard there from Andy Moore, we knew something was happening about a week ago, didn't we? Well, there were lots of sort of rumours, uh, and certainly the WikiLeaks themselves as an organisation said they feared that this was about to happen. Um, what this is, is, is essentially the product of a long negotiation between the Ecuadorian authorities and the British government um, that has been going on for some time. Um, the Ecuadorians are under relatively new political leadership, and although originally a previous administration gave Mr. Assange asylum, the current administration is, has been much more hostile to him and has been looking for a solution as they see it to this, this situation. And essentially, the, the deal, is, as I understand it, is that um, the Ecuadorians have agreed that, in their view, Mr. Assange has breached his asylum conditions. In other words, that when you, when you claim asylum and you seek asylum and you go into somebody's embassy, there are certain rules you have to abide by, so that you can't engage in political activity and things like that. And they have argued uh, and come to a conclusion that Mr. Assange has breached those rules. So as a result, the Ecuadorians withdrew uh, their asylum. As a result of that, they were able to invite the British police into the embassy. Now, that's a big thing, because the, the, the Ecuadorian embassy is Ecuadorian soil. Uh, and so the British police need permission to enter. They have entered, as we've just seen in those pictures, they have arrested Mr. Assange, taken him to a police station. And what will now happen is that he will um, uh, attend a uh, Westminster Magistrates Court to face charges of breaching bail. In other words, when this story began all those years ago and um, uh, there was an attempt to extradite him to the United States and to Switzerland, extradition proceedings were taking place. And while that was happening, the judge and the court said, look, OK, Mr. Assange, you can stay at liberty while these proceedings are going on. By going and hiding in the Ecuadorian embassy, he is alleged to have breached those conditions. So those are the charges that he will face when he goes up um, before the magistrates, as the police say, as soon as possible. Okay, so just to get this straight, those allegations originating from Sweden are now dropped. They, they were dropped well, here, Yes, the, 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 the allegations of sexual offences mm -hmm. in Sweden against Mr. Assange have now lapsed. Uh, lawyers tell me they can be reactivated. Right. There's nothing to stop that process happening. But at the moment, they are not extant. Uh, and so, that therefore, the, the, the legal procedure that Mr. Assange will face immediately is UK law for breach of um, uh, bail here in the United Kingdom. Okay. Interestingly enough, we're hearing from, as you said, President Moreno has said that these were repeated violations of international conventions. WikiLeaks are saying that his asylum was illegally terminated um, in violation of international law. This could go on and on. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, this, there, there will be a sort of, you know, a, a strong legal dispute over this. Um, it's already this entire dispute has been heavily sort of legalized, if you want to use that phrase, um, because, uh, you know, the law, you know, essentially uh, part of this case is a political one, but also it is a legal one. They have lawyers, um, WikiLeaks, who have been defending Mr. Assange assiduously over the years. Uh, and that, but, but initially, even if uh, WikiLeaks claim that the Ecuadorians have breached asylum law and what they have done, that won't change the circumstances, namely that Mr. Assange is now in British custody and will face British justice. Okay, James, we'll leave it there for now. Obviously, lots of reaction coming in, and I'm sure we'll speak to you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're watching BBC News. Um, other stories making the headlines now. And Jack Shepard, the British man who spent 10 months on the run after a speedboat crash in which a woman died, has been sentenced to six months in jail after pleading guilty at the Old Bailey uh, to breaching bail and fleeing before his trial. Now, in his absence, he was found guilty of the manslaughter of Charlotte Brown, who was 24, and he was then sentenced to six years in jail. The new six-month sentence is to run consecutively. Well, our reporter, Catherine uh, Stancheshen, is at the Old Bailey in central London. Catherine, just update us with the latest, please. 
Well, we've just heard from Charlotte Brown's family here outside the Old Bailey today. They were all in court for that additional six-month sentence that Jack Shepherd has now uh, received. Katie Brown, Charlotte's sister, attempted to read out a statement. She was very emotional. She found it quite hard, and her dad, Graham Brown, had to take over at certain points. Uh, they say that Jack Shepherd has shown no remorse and has taken no responsibility for those dreadful actions of that night back in December 2015. Uh, they say she would still be here today uh, if it wasn't for him, and he seems to show no understanding of what he's called. Uh, they say they believe he deliberately ran to Georgia last year and he'd still be there evading justice if it wasn't for the press and for the police as well. Uh, Jack Shepard appeared in court this morning. Um, we saw him, of course, on, on that footage that the BBC gained last night on the plane back from Tbilisi in Georgia back to Gatwick. He has been in custody in Georgia since January when he handed himself in to authorities and extradition proceedings have been ongoing since then. Uh, he, he ran, he chose to skip bail last year in March before his trial for the manslaughter of Charlotte could begin and he was convicted to six years then uh, for that manslaughter by gross negligence. This six months will be in addition to those six years and uh, today his defence barrister Andrew McGee said that he chose to come back. Um, he made that decision against at the advice of his Georgian lawyers because he felt that it was the right thing to do. Uh, he said he ran originally because he was terrified at the prospect of a prison sentence and he is ashamed now of that decision, but he was overwhelmed and he accepts what he did was cowardly, but uh, Andrew McGee said it wasn't callous or cavalier and it wasn't cynical or calculated. That is not something that Charlotte Brown's family have accepted today. Uh, they say she was an extraordinary daughter. This is an unimaginable ideal and the uh, ordeal and the only way they have held themselves together is in memory of her. Okay, Catherine stone at the Old Bailey. Thank you for now. Um, we're going to cross to Anita McVeigh who's uh, in Westminster for us. Uh, a busy old day ahead, Anita. It is it certainly follows a very busy old night into the wee small hours, in fact, Luquesa. Thank you very much, yes, and welcome here to Westminster. Well, call it a breathing space, call it too long, call it a flex extension, whatever your political viewpoint. Uh, Brexit has been delayed until the 31st of October, uh, potentially, as European leaders gave Britain six more months to approve their Brexit deal. The UK will now leave the EU at the end of October. However, it could be sooner if MPs give their support to Theresa May's <coughs> Brexit deal. Well, the announcement of the flexible extension, or flextension as it's being labelled, came after hours of late night talks at that emergency EU summit in Brussels. So the UK will now no longer leave the EU tomorrow. The new Brexit deadline is the 31st of October. But the UK can leave before that date if MPs agree, as we were mentioning, the withdrawal agreement. As things stand, the UK will take part in European Parliament elections. Those are scheduled for the 23rd of May, as you can see on your screens. And if it fails to do so, it will leave the EU without a deal on June the 1st. Well, the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, said the extension gave Britain time to find the best solution and added, please do not waste this time. Well, let's talk now to our Brussels correspondent, Adam Fleming, who's been following all the details late into the night and uh, since early this morning again. Adam, hello to you. Uh, tell us more about how this date of the 31st of October, what was thrashed out last night, and in particular, what clues it give, uh, gives us to how much patience the EU might have going forward. Well, the answer to your second question is the EU still has quite a lot of patience and that they are not at the stage where they want to push the UK over a cliff. So at this point, as long as the EU, UK wants to stay in the EU and delay Brexit, Brexit will be delayed. And I think the most important thing to watch in the coming months is whether that mood shifts and actually 
Does the EU reach a tipping point where it feels this just cannot continue? And there were some hints from leaders last night as they were leaving the summit that a, an, an extra extension in October, uh, I can't believe we're even looking that far forward already, um, would be much more difficult than the extension that's just been granted. The reason we've ended up with that extension until the 31st of October, yes, Halloween, is because it's a compromise. A compromise between a group of countries led by the Netherlands and Germany that wanted a longer extension, perhaps up until the end of March 2020, and a smaller group of countries, but very vocally led by France, that wanted a much, much shorter extension, much more along the lines of what Theresa May was asking for, of the 30th of June, so in the middle of the summer. And the EU likes to think of itself as a compromise machine, so the date that was spat out by the compromise machine was the 31st of October. Um, and so, I mean, there was another discussion last night as well, another little bit of a row about could you have a mechanism to ensure the UK's good behaviour during the extension, whatever length it, w- it was. It ends up there is no such mechanism. You're either a full member of the EU or you're not. And so there is no mechanism, no review clause or special conditions put on the UK, other than that it will have to respect the principle of sincere cooperation, which is already written into the treaty. There will be a mo- review moment, though, at the next scheduled summit uh, of EU leaders in June, but that will not be a decision-making moment or where anything really will happen. It will be an update on just what progress has been made in the UK on getting this deal through, finally. Okay, Adam, thank you very much. So, all eyes return here to Westminster, and let's just go through what's expected to happen here in the coming hours and days. Uh, Theresa May is due to update MPs following the emergency EU summit. Uh, That's due to happen soon. Cross-party talks with the Labour Party are expected to continue. And uh, tomorrow, MPs will uh, take that bit of breathing space. They'll go on their Easter recess, and they're not scheduled to return until the 23rd of April. So uh, let's take stock of developments here now with uh, Vicky Young, who's inside uh, the Houses of Parliament. And Vicky, apart from now knowing the length of the extension, all the big other questions remain unanswered, don't they, including uh, whether MPs will be able to come up with a deal that a majority can agree on in that six months, and indeed whether Theresa May will still be Prime Minister at the end of that time. Yeah, I mean, people talk about it being breathing space. One cabinet minister said it's going to be purgatory, this whole process continuing. Many people think this is just really kicking the can down the road yet again. But a very important question about what that time will be used for. And of course, as ever, people here have very different views about it. And I think the fact that that pressure of an imminent deadline has gone away means that lots of people think that their option could now be back on the table again. And as you say, as well as that whole issue of Theresa May's leadership, Downing Street making it very clear she announced that she would leave once the first stage of Brexit was completed, getting through the withdrawal agreement. Of course, that still hasn't happened, so according to them, she is going nowhere. Let's have a listen to what the Cabinet Minister, Andrea Leadsom, thought about the latest news. We have to use the time to make sure that we deliver the Brexit that we're all looking for, that we work closely with the EU and that they're genuinely helping to make sure we do deliver on the referendum. There won't be any changing our minds about that. We are absolutely determined to deliver on that referendum. Now, those talks with Labour, of course, have been ongoing for a week now. Everyone being very positive about them, although there is no sign of a breakthrough. Many people thinking that the idea of a customs union could be a compromise, but of course that is pretty unpopular amongst many in the Conservative Party. But this is what Labour's Brexit spokesman Keir Starmer thinks about the latest delay. Well, I think it's a good thing that there's an extension. Uh, We needed it. I think businesses and communities across the country will be very relieved that we're not leaving tomorrow without a deal. The real question for the Prime Minister is what she's going to use this time for, um, because we can't carry on going on as we are now at the moment. Uh, How are the negotiations going between Labour and the the government? Well, the negotiations, as you know, are in good faith. Um, I think we all feel a, a deep sense of duty to try and break the impasse. Um, But there is, you know, a long distance between us and some really difficult challenges um, if we're going to find a way forward. So the talks are ongoing, um, but, you know, there are challenges in there. What what are the main sticking points? Well, the substance, of course, we're very clear about the need for a customs union. But there's also this question of how on earth do we ensure that anything that this Prime Minister promises is actually delivered in the future? Because, of course, she's already said that she's going to step down uh, probably within months. 
to Keir Starmer there. Let's discuss this a little bit more. I'm joined by the former Brexit minister, uh, David Jones. You wanted to leave, well, you wanted to leave on the 29th of March. We're not going to be leaving tomorrow either. Some of your colleagues, Brexiteer colleagues, fear that Brexit's been lost. I don't think it's been lost. Uh, of course, the fact is that we do have an Act of Parliament that provides that we should leave the European Union, and that is what prevails. Uh, and I think that to lose Brexit completely would be so devastating politically. Uh, we would be basically tearing up the wishes of 17.4 million people that I can't see that that can happen. EU elections, though, very likely to take place now. How do you feel about that? Well, I think that it's, it's very regrettable. Uh, it's estimated that they'd cost about £108 million. Pounds, and one wonders who would want to stand as a candidate for those elections when that person would be spending several weeks trudging the pavements, knocking on doors, and the maximum that they would be elected for would be for four months. I think it's, it's very difficult. What about Theresa May's leadership? Downing Street making it very clear that she has promised to go, but only once her deal, the withdrawal agreement, goes through. And your party has no way of getting rid of her, does it? Well, I think that the, the regrettable thing, of course, is that we've now seen the withdrawal agreement rejected three times by the House of Commons by very large majorities. The Prime, Prime Minister doesn't appear to accept that. But what she did appear to indicate in the video that he, she published a couple of days ago was that she was not going to proceed with the withdrawal agreement. Uh, so that being the case, it seems to me that the condition that she placed upon her departure has now disappeared. And really, I do think that she needs to consider uh, whether her leadership is actually for the benefit of the party. Party, uh, and of the country as a whole. You presumably don't think it is? Well, I think that now is the time where we need to see a fresh face. Uh, what can they do that's different, given the parliamentary numbers? Well, I think that quite clearly the, a, a new leader would be able to go there with a, with a new agenda, would be able to make clear that that person was willing to leave the European Union without an agreement if necessary. That's something that uh, the current Prime Minister has never been willing to do, uh, but I think that a, a tougher approach is called for. Do you think that these six months then should be used to prepare for no deal, even though Parliament's made it very clear it won't accept that and has actually passed new laws and shows it can do that? Well, I think that certainly we should be preparing for no deal. In fact, I know that preparations have been made for no deal. And I think it's important to show the European Union that we're quite prepared to leave if necessary. I think that a change of leadership in the Conservative Party would reset the position. And I think that this is something that we should be looking for. Okay, David Jones, thank you very much indeed. But that is a problem, of course, because there was a move against Theresa May in December under the Conservative Party rules. She can't be challenged again until December. And an interesting aside in all of this is that even some of those who are candidates potentially to be the next leader might not actually want to take the job over right now with all this uncertainty. We'll have to see how it pans out in the next few weeks. Vicky, thank you very much. Well, with me now is the chair of the Brexit Select Committee and Labour MP, Hilary Benn. Uh, thank you very much for joining us again here on BBC Newsroom Live. Um, you are obviously welcoming this uh, extra time that the EU has given to the UK, but I suppose the big question is having not been able to come up with an agreement that a majority of MPs can support in the time the UK has had so far. Can it do it in the next six months? Well, that is the big question. It's what Donald Tusk said last night, make good use of the time. Look, the most important thing about the decision taken in the early hours in Brussels is that we will not be leaving without an agreement tomorrow evening. And I think there's a collective exhalation of breath on the part particularly of a business because it would have been so damaging. But the truth is, Parliament has shown itself unwilling to support the Prime Minister's deal. I hope the talks produce something, but I'm clear now, and I've come to this view reluctantly, that the only way we are going to resolve this and reach a decision, which is in the national interest that we should have a decision, is to put whatever deal is agreed with the EU, and that might change as a result of the talks, but to put that back to the British people and say, here's the choice. This is what leaving looks like, not the fantasy offered during the referendum. This is the choices that are involved in leaving, and if you don't want to do that, then we would decide to remain. Uh, and that's irrespective of whether the cross-party talks between the Conservatives and Labour bear fruit. Obviously, if that happened, the, the nature of the question might change slightly. It would change, but that's really important because... Look, I don't know whether the British people have changed their minds or not on this subject that is, you know, consuming all our effort and energy, and therefore...
whatever leave proposition is put in such a referendum. the closer the economic relationship, then the less risk to the British economy in the future, because people might vote to leave on the basis of that. And therefore that's why it's right that Labour is participating in good faith in the talks. Well, uh, speaking of good faith, we've heard from business this morning uh, saying you know an imminent crisis averted but there's a fresh start needed and that sincere cross-party cooperation is needed do you feel that the the effort that's going on now is is sincere i think it is i mean the speaking from the labor side you listen to what keir starmer and jeremy corbyn have said labor went into those talks uh, they are continuing the the problem, however, is, is the government prepared to shift an inch? Because if the government doesn't move, it's all very well saying, I want to have cross-party talks now, but if the government won't move on its red lines, it's very hard to see how any agreement can be reached. Uh, and the problem within Labour, surely, as well, is that you're not absolutely certain that Jeremy Corbyn is demanding another vote, another referendum, call it what you will, to guarantee Labour's support uh, for the Conservatives if it comes to that. Well, that has been raised as, uh, as, raised, as I understand it, in the talks. We have whipped in Parliament um, twice in the last two weeks to support a confirmatory referendum. And I think a deal, if a deal was reached that came back to Labour MPs, which said, here's a deal, but I'm afraid it doesn't include a government commitment to a confirmatory referendum, then there'd be a lot of Labour MPs who wouldn't vote for it. Yeah. And going back to your point about the CBI, for the CBI, for business, big and small, the best way of resolving this now is to go back to the people because you would get a decision. And thus far, Parliament has shown that it's not able to reach agreement on a way forward. Let me be clear, if a deal was reached between Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May, would that deal be put to all Labour MPs before it would be signed off? Well, I don't know what the precise mechanism would be, but look, as everything in Brexit, Labour MPs would not be backward in expressing their view about whether they were prepared to vote for it or not. And in the end, you have to have the numbers in the House of Commons for something to go through. And we're in this position because there are not the numbers to support the Prime Minister's deal. Just very briefly, if I may, uh, a word on European Parliament elections. How does Labour feel about the prospect of, of going into those elections when, you know, potentially other parties like uh, Change UK, like the Brexit Party, might do rather well? I think we've got to be clear as a party that we are working to try and get a better deal, but we are also absolutely committed to putting whatever deal is finally agreed with the EU to the British people so they can take that decision. Because that would enable a lot of people who would rather stay in the European Union uh, to vote for Labour, and I hope that's the campaign that we will fight. Okay, Hilary Benn, thank you very much thank for you. your time. Uh, just a reminder, we are expecting at some point, uh, either this morning or perhaps a little after lunch, that statement from Theresa May on those talks last night. It was supposed to be a little earlier, but it's slipping. Needless to say, when that happens, we will bring it to you live. We'll be back here very shortly, uh, but for now, back to Luquesa in the studio. Anita, thank you very much indeed. Okay, let's return to our breaking story and uh, that arrest of uh, Julian Assange. Um, well, joining me now is uh, Geoffrey Robertson QC. He's a member of uh, Julian Assange's uh, legal team. Thank you for speaking to us here at uh, BBC News. Legal team. He has quite a few. But, oh, hello. Shall we? We'll just keep, we'll just keep talking for a moment, uh, Mr. Robinson. We've, we've lost the picture, but we can carry on with the sound. Uh, your reaction first to this news. Well, I think it's a disgrace and it's a breach of international law. Ecuador uh, will be blackballed from international uh, society for doing this. You can't give someone asylum for seven years and then hand them over, which is what Ecuador has done, by force to uh, those who would make them captive. It is uh, a, a cruel and astounding breach of faith on the part of the Ecuadorian government. Of course, we know why it's being done, 
uh, because the government has changed. They're now keen to get loans from the United, United States, uh, and they have done the United States bidding. Well, that's a matter of international politics, but it is a breach of international law to hand over someone whom you've given asylum to, which is what Ecuador appears to have done. Uh, the next question, of course, is what happens to Mr. Assange. He'll be held, uh, he can apply for bail, but he will be accused of breaching his bail, uh, which is a, an offence of a lower order, usually dealt with by a fine or by imprisonment for a few weeks. Uh, that is not what he's worried about. Indeed, in a way, he's better off in some senses in prison than in the embassy where he's been denied medical treatment. He can't, he hasn't been able to go to hospital for chest x-rays and so on that his specialists have recommended. But of course, this gives America, which is hell-bent on putting him in prison for a very long time to deter those who publish material about the behavior, uh, the illegal behavior in many cases of its armed forces, uh, will want to put him away. They've got charges ready, uh, that total 45 years in a supermax prison. Uh, can, I, can I just interrupt there very quickly? Yes. I mean, we, we, we appear to have had um, confirmation from the British government given to uh, the government of Ecuador, the pres President Moreno, saying that he would not be extradited to a country where he could face torture or the death penalty. Excellent. We assume that includes America. No, because America... America will as assure the British government that he won't face the death penalty. And certain charges under the Espionage Act carry the death penalty, but they are not the charges that they will seek to extradite him on. The charges they want to extradite 